Hello, and welcome back, readers. We last left you in the Temeraire Book One, His Majesty's Dragon, otherwise known as, by Naomi Novik. Uh, Admiral Lenton had just said goodbye, uh, good night uh, to to uh, the pilots, and now we're going to see what happens the next morning. Temeraire slept very heavily and late the next morning, leaving Lawrence to occupy himself for some hours after breakfast. He met Berkeley at the table. He walked back with him to see Maximus. The regal copper was still eating, a procession of fresh-slaughtered sheep going down his gullet one after another. He only rumbled a wordless, mouthful greeting as they came to the clearing. Berkeley brought out a bottle of rather terrible wine and drank most of it himself while Lawrence sipped at his glass to be polite. As they told over the battle again with diagrams scratched in the dirt and pebbles representing the dragons... We would do very well to add a light flyer, a grayling, if one can be spared to fly lookout above the formation, Berkeley said, sitting back heavily upon a rock. It is all our big dragons being young, with the big ones panic in that way. When the big ones panic in that way, the little ones will have a start, even if they know better. Lawrence nodded. Although I hope this misadventure will at least give them some experience in dealing with the fright, he said. In any event, the French cannot count on having such ideal circumstances often. Without the cloud cover, they should never have managed it. Gentlemen, are you looking over the plan of yesterday? Choiseul had been walking past towards the headquarters. He joined them and crouched down beside the diagram. I am very sorry to have been away at the beginning. His coat was dusty and his neckcloth was stained badly with sweat. He looked as though he had not shifted his clothes since yesterday, and a thin tracery of red veins stood out in the whites of his eyes. He rubbed his face as he looked down. "'Have you been up all night?' Lawrence asked. Choiseul shook his head. "'No, but I took it in turns with Catherine, with Arcourt, to sleep a little, by Lily. She would not rest otherwise.' His, he shut his eyes in an enormous yawn and nearly fell over. "'Merci,' he said, grateful for Lawrence's steadying hand, and pushed himself slowly to his feet. "'I will leave you. I must get Catherine some food.' "'Pray go and get some rest,' Lawrence said. "'I will bring her something.' Temeraire is asleep, and I'm at liberty. Harcourt herself was wide awake, pale with anxiety, but steady now, giving orders to the crew and feeding Lily with chunks of still-steaming beef from her own hand, a constant stream of encouragement coming from her lips. Lawrence had brought her some bread with bacon. She would have taken the sandwich in her bloody hands, unwilling to interrupt, but he managed to coax her away long enough to wash a little and eat while a crewman took her place probably a good idea. Lily kept eating, with one golden eye resting on Harcourt for reassurance. Choiseul came back before Harcourt had been quite finished, uh, his neckcloth and coat gone, and a servant following with a pot of coffee, strong and hot. Your lieutenant is looking for you, Lawrence. Tamaraire begins to stir, he said, sitting down again heavily beside her. I cannot manage to sleep. The coffee has done me well. Thank you, Jean Paul. If you're not too tired, I would be grateful. Oh, thank you, Jean Paul. If you're not too tired, I would be grateful for your company, she said, already drinking her second cup. Pray, have no hesitation, Lawrence. I'm sure Tamara must be anxious. I'm obliged to you for coming. Lawrence bowed to them both, though he had a sense of awkwardness for the first occasion since he had grown used to Harcourt. She was leaning with no appearance of consciousness against Choiseul's shoulder and he was looking down at her with undisguised warmth. She was quite young, after all, and Lawrence could not help feeling the absence of any suitable chaperone. He consoled himself that nothing could happen with Lily and the crew present, even if they had not been both been so obviously done in. In any case, he could hardly stay under the circumstances, and he hurried away to Tamaraire's clearing. The rest of the day he spent gratefully in idleness, seated comfortably in his usual place in the crook of Tamaraire's foreleg, and writing letters. He had formed an extensive correspondence while at sea, with all the long hours to fill, and now many of his acquaintances were owed responses. His mother, too, had managed to write him several hasty and short letters, evidently kept from his father's knowledge. At least they were not franked, so Lawrence was obliged to pay to receive them. Having gorged himself to compensate for his lack of appetite the night before, Tamaraire then listened to the letters Lawrence was writing and dictated his own contributions, sending greetings to Lady Allendale and to Riley. 
and do ask Captain Riley to give my best wishes to the crew of the Reliant, he said. He seems, it seems so very long ago, Lawrence, does it not? I have not had fish in months now. Lawrence smiled at this measure of time. I think it's just also great that, of course, if a dragon can talk and interact with people and be like a partner, yeah, they can dictate their own letters or at least contribute to the letters of other humans. It just makes them even more just fantastic as a character in, in an alternate history, you know, just how human uh, they can be, but yet be so fantastic in their what they can do. Lawrence smiled at this measure of time. A great deal has happened, certainly. It is a strange to think that it, was not, that it has not been a year, he said, sealing the envelopes writing the, and writing the direction. I only hope that they are all well. It was the last, and he laid it upon the substantial pile with satisfaction. He was a great deal easier in his conscience now. You ever felt that way too? You finally get a, a pile of work done. You get back to a bunch of emails. There is that great feeling. I know the. I know that. Roland, he called, and she came running up from where the cadets were playing a game of jacks. Take this to the dispatch post, he said, handing her the stack. Sir, she said, a little nervously accepting the letters. When I am done, may I have liberty for the evening? He was startled by the request. Several of the ensigns and midwig men had put in for liberty, and it had been granted that they might visit the city. But the idea of a ten-year-old cadet wandering about Dover, alone, was absurd, even if she were not a girl. Would this be for yourself alone, or would you be going with one of the others? He asked, thinking she might have been invited to join one of the older officers in a respectable excursion. No, sir, only for me she said, and looked so very hopeful that Lawrence thought for a moment of granting it and taking her himself. But he could not leave, he did not, could not like to leave Tamarare alone to brood over the previous day. Perhaps another time, Roland, he said gently. We will be in here, we will be here in Dover for a long time now, and I promise you will have another opportunity. Oh, she said downcast. Yes, sir. She went away drooping so that Lawrence felt guilty. Tamarare watched her go and inquired, "'Lawrence, is there something particularly interesting in Dover that we might go and see it? So many of our crew seem to be to making a visit.' "'Oh, dear,' Lawrence said. He felt rather awkward, explaining that the main attraction was the abundance of harbor prostitutes and cheap liquor. "'Well, a city has a great many people in it, and thus various entertainments provided in close proximity,' he tried. "'Do you mean such as more books?' Tamarare said, I ha but I have s never seen Dunn or Collins reading, and they were so very excited to be going. They talked of nothing else all yesterday evening. Lawrence silently cursed the two unfortunate young wingmen for complicating his tasks, already planning their next week's duties in a vengeful spirit. There is also the theater and concerts, he said lamely, but this was carrying concealment too far. The sting of dishonesty was unpleasant, and he could not bear to feel he had been deceitful to Temeraire, who was, after all, was grown now. But I am afraid that some of them go there to drink and keep low company, he said more frankly. Oh, you mean whores, Temeraire said, startling Lawrence so greatly he nearly fell from his seat. I did not know they had those in cities, too, but now I understand. "'Where on earth had you heard of them?' Lawrence asked, steadying himself. Now relieved of the burden of explanation, he felt irrationally offended that someone else had chosen to enlighten Temeraire. "'Oh, Victoriatus at Loch Lagan told me, for I wondered why the officers were going down to the village when they did not have family there,' Temeraire said. "'But you have never gone. Are you sure you would not like to?' he added almost hopefully. "'My dear,' You must not say such things, Lawrence said, blushing and shaking with laughter at the same time. It is not a respectable subject for conversation at all. And if men cannot be prevented from indulging the habit, they ought at least not to be encouraged. I shall certainly speak with Dunn and Collins. They ought not to be bragging about it, and especially not where the ensigns might hear. I do not understand, Tamarer said. Vindicatus said that it was prodigiously nice for men, and also desirable for otherwise they might like to get married, and that did not sound very pleasant at all. Although, if you very much wish to, I suppose I would not mind. He made this last speech with very little sincerity, looking at Lawrence sideways as if to gauge the effect. Lawrence's mirth and embarrassment both faded at once. I'm afraid you have been given some very incomplete knowledge, he said gently. Forgive me. 
I ought to have spoken of these matters to you before. I must beg you to have no anxiety. You are my first charge, and will always be, even if I should ever marry, and I do not suppose I will. He paused a moment to reflect if speaking further would give Temeraire more worry, but in the end he decided to err on the side of full confidence, and added, There was something of an understanding between myself and a lady before you came to me, but she has since set me at liberty. Do you mean she has refused you? Temeraire said, very indignantly, by the way of demonstrating that dragons might be as contrary as men. Oh, by by way of demonstrating that dragons might be as contrary as men. I'm very sorry, Lawrence. If you like to get married, I'm sure you can find someone else much nicer. That is very flattering, but I assure you I have not the least desire to seek out a replacement, Lawrence said. Temeraire ducked his head a little and made no further demurrals, quite evidently pleased. But Lawrence, he said, then halted. Lawrence, he asked, if it is not a fit subject, does that mean I ought not to speak of it any more? You must be careful to avoid it in any wider company, but you may always speak of anything you like to me, Lawrence said. I am merely curious now, if that is all there is in Dover, Temeraire said, for Roland is too young for whores, is she not? I'm beginning to feel the need, uh, the need of a glass of wine to fortify myself against this conversation, Lawrence said ruefully. Thankfully, Tamaraire was satisfied with some further explanation as to what the theater and concerts might be, and the other attractions of a city. He turned his attention to willingly to a discussion of the planned route for their patrol, which a runner had brought over that morning, and even inquired about the possibility of catching some fish for dinner. Lawrence was glad to see him so recovered in spirit after the previous day's misfortunes, and had just decided that he would take Roland to town after all if Tamaraire did not object when he saw her returning in the company of another captain, a woman. He had been sitting upon Tamaraire's foreleg in what he was abruptly conscious as a state of disarray. He hurriedly climbed down on the far side so that he was briefly hidden by Tamaraire's body. There was no time to put back his coat, which was hung over a tree limb some distance away in any case but he tucked his shirt back into his trousers, tied his neckcloth hastily back round his neck. He came round to make a bow and nearly stumbled as he saw her clearly. She was not unhandsome, but her face was marred badly by a scar that would only have been made by a sword. The left eye drooped a little at the corner where the blade had just missed it, and the flesh drawn along the angry red line all along the way down her face. Oh, and the flesh was drawn along the angry red line all the way down her face fading to a thinner white scar along her neck. She was his own age, or perhaps a little older. The scar made it difficult to tell. But in any case, she wore the triple bars which marked her as a senior captain, with a small gold medal of the Nile on her lapel. "'Lawrence, is it?' she said, without wasting any sort of introduction. While she was still busy striving— while he was still striving— busy striving to conceal his surprise— I am Jane Rowland, Exidium's captain. I would like I would take it as a personal favor if I might have Emily for the evening, if she can possibly be spared. She glanced pointedly at the idle cadets and ensigns. Her tone was sarcastic, and she was clearly offended. I beg your pardon, Lawrence said, realizing his mistake. I had thought she wanted liberty to visit the town. I did not realize, and here he barely caught himself. He was quite sure they were mother and daughter not only because of the shared name, but also a certain similarity of feature and expression. But he could not simply make the assumption. Certainly you may have her, he finished instead. Hearing his explanation, Captain Roland unbent at once. Ha! I see. What mischief mischief you must have imagined her getting into. She said her laugh was curiously hearty and unfeminine. Well, I promise she shan't. I shan't let her run wild, and I'll have her back by eight o'clock. Thank you. Exidium and I have not seen her in almost a year, and we are in danger of forgetting what she looks like. Lawrence bowed and saw them off, Roland hurrying to keep up with her mother's long, mannish stride, speaking the whole time in obvious excitement and enthusiasm, and waving her hands towards her friends as she went away. Watching them go, Lawrence felt a little foolish. He had at, le- he had at last grown used to Captain Harcourt, and should have been able to draw the natural conclusion— Exidium was, after all, another long wing. Presumably, he, too, insisted on a female captain, just as did Lily. 
and with his many years of service, his captain would have scarcely have avoided a battle. Yet Lawrence had to own he was surprised, and not a little shocked, to see a woman so cut about and so forward. Harcourt, his only other example of a female captain, was by no means missish, but was, she was still quite young and conscious of her early promotion, which perhaps made her less assured. I also really like, of course, the injection of the female's role in the, the aerial corps, this, this fictitious uh, branch of the military put in a you know quasi uh, accurate historical timeline here, and also shows, among many things, there could be some great progression in terms of um, you know old-fashioned behaviors and views about females serving in the armed forces. What if a dragon required it? Of course, society would change, uh, and and people would get used to it, and they would see that's fine, as if not an advantage in some ways. So I like that, right? Who doesn't? That's a um, thank you, uh, Naomi Novik, for putting that in. With the subject of marriage so fresh in his mind after his discussion with Tamarere, he also could not help wondering about Emily's father. If marriage was an awkward proposition for a male aviator, it, seriously, it seemed nearly inconceivable for a female one. The only thing he could imagine was that Emily was natural-born, and as soon as the idea occurred to him, he scolded himself to be entertaining such thoughts about a perfectly respectable woman he had just met. But his involuntary guess proved entirely correct in the event. I'm afraid I have not the slightest idea. I have not seen him in ten years, she said later that evening. She had invited him to join her for a late supper at the officers' club after bringing Emily back, and after a few glasses of wine, he had not been able to resist making a tentative inquiry after the health of Emily's father. It's not as though we were married, you know. I do not believe he even knows Emily's name. He seemed wholly uncon She seemed wholly unconscious of any shame. And after all, Lawrence had privately felt any more legitimate situation would have been impossible. But he was uncomfortable nevertheless, thankfully, though she noticed. Thankfully, though she noticed, she did not take any offense at it for herself, but rather said kindly, I dare say that our ways are still odd to you. But you can marry if you like. It is not held against you at all in the corps. It is only that it is rather hard on the other person always taking second place to a dragon. For my own part, I have never felt anything wanting. I should never have desired children if it were not for Exidium's sake. Although Emily is a dear, and I'm very happy to have her. But it is sadly inconvenient for all that. So Emily is to follow you as captain, Lawrence said. May I ask you, are the dragons, the long-lived ones, I mean, always inherited in this way? When we can manage it, they take it very hard, you see, losing a handler. They are more likely to accept a new one if someone is there to have some connection to, and with whom they shares, and with whom they feel shares their grief, she said. So we breed ourselves as much as them. I expect they will be asking you to manage one or two for the corps yourself. Good Lord, he said, startled by the idea. He had discarded the thought of children with his plans of marriage. From the very moment of Edith's refusal, and still further gone now that he was aware of Tamarere's objections, he could not immediately imagine how he might arrange the matter. I suppose it must be rather shocking to you. Uh, poor fellow, I'm, I'm sorry. Oh, I suppose it should be rather shocking to you, poor fellow. I am sorry, she said. I would offer, but you ought to wait until he is at least ten years old. And in any case, I cannot be spared just now. Lawrence required a moment to understand what she meant, but he snatched up his wing. But he then he snatched up his wine glass with an unsteady hand and endeavored to conceal his face behind it. He could feel color rising in his cheeks, despite all the will in the world to prevent it. Very kind, he said into the cup, strangled half between mortification and laughter. It was not the sort of offer he had ever envisioned receiving, even if it had only half been made. Catherine might do for you by then, however, Roland went on, still in that appallingly practical tone. That might do nicely, indeed. You could have one each for Lily and Tamarere. Thank you, he said very firmly, in desperation, trying to change the subject. May I bring you a glass of something to drink? Oh, yes, port would be splendid, thank you, she said. By this time, she, he was beyond being shocked, and when he returned with two glasses, she offered him the, an already-lit cigar, and he shared it with her willingly. 
He stayed talking with her for several hours more, until they were the only ones left in the club, and the servants were beginning to pointedly stop concealing their yawns. They're like, get out of here, right? They climbed the stairs together. It is not so very late as all that, she said, looking at the handsome great clock at the end of the upper landing. Are you very tired? We might have a hand or two of piquet in my rooms. By this time, he had begun to be so easy with her that he thought nothing of the suggestion. When he left her at last, very late, to return to his own rooms, a servant was walking down the hall and glanced at him. Only then did he consider the propriety of his behavior and suffer a qualm. But the damage, if any, had already been done. He put it from his mind and sought his bed at last. So I think we see there that nothing untoward happened uh, with Captain Roland in her rooms. They just played some more cards. She's just kind of a late nighter or whatever. But he's kind of like, I just left that lady's room late at night. A servant saw me. They're going to draw their own conclusions. So here we are on to uh, Chapter 10. And I'll just keep plowing ahead here since we've got some time. Chapter 10. Aren't you pumped, right? We're going to keep going. He was sufficiently experienced to no longer be very surprised the next morning when he found that their late night had led to no gossip. Instead, Captain Roland hailed him warmly at breakfast and introduced him to her lieutenants without the slightest consciousness, and they walked out to their dragons together. Lawrence saw Tamaraire finishing off a hearty breakfast of his own and took a moment to have a private and forceful word with Collins and Dune about their discretion. He did not mean to go on like a blue-light captain, preaching chastity and temperance all day. Still, he did not think it prudish if he preferred his youngsters to have a respectable example before them in the older officers. If you must keep such company, I do not propose I do not propose to have you making whoremongers of yourselves and giving the ensigns and cadets the notion that this is how they ought to behave, he said while the two midwingmen squirmed. Dune often even opened his mouth and looked as though he would rather like to protest but subsided under Lawrence's very cold stare. That was a degree of insubordination he did not intend to permit. Having finished the lecture and dismissed them to their work, he found himself a trifle uneasy as he recalled that his own behavior of the previous night was not above reproach. He consoled himself by the reminder that Roland was a fellow officer. Her company could hardly be compared to that of Hoare's, and in any case... They had not created any sort of public spectacle, which was at the heart of the matter. However, the rationalization rang a little hollow, and he was glad to distract himself with work. Emily and the two other runners were already waiting by Tamarera's side with the heavy bags of post that had accumulated for the blockading fleet. Remember, that's where they're going to go. The very strength of the British fleet left the ships on the blockade in strangely isolated circumstances. It was rarely necessary for a dragon to be sent to their assistance. They received all but their most urgent dispatches and supplies by frigate, and so had little opportunity to hear recent news or receive their post. The French might have twenty-one ships in Brest, but they did not dare come out to face the far more skilled British sailors. Without naval support, even a full French heavy combat wing could not risk a strafing run with the sharpshooters always ready in the tops and the harpoon and pepper guns pried upon the deck. So here we hear there, we hear what would be the uh, early 19th century equivalent of anti-aircraft guns on the great British battleships of the day. So you've got sharpshooters, men with long rifles, very accurate rifles, uh, probably could pick off captains and other uh, crew members on the on the dragons themselves. And remember, if a dragon loses a captain, they are completely inconsolable and basically out of the fight. Um, and then also they've got pepper guns, which sound like, you know, a shotgun sort of uh, spraying out many different balls to cover a wide area. And then harpoons, we all know what those are. Okay. A giant dart, effectively. Okay. Occasionally, there might be an attack at night, usually made by a single nocturnal breed dragon, which we heard about in the previous chapter. But the riflemen often gave as good as they got in such circumstances, and if a full-scale attack were ever launched, a flare signal could easily be seen by the patrolling dragons to the north. Admiral Lenton, so they also have sort of combat air patrols, so there's already, there's always dragons up in the air in the north waiting to see if a flare goes up. So they have, flares have been, around, have been around, they've they have rockets by now, simple fireworks and stuff like that, those have been known. So they could light up the sky, send out a signal. It makes sense, you know, uh, why the ships would not be immediately sort of obsolete or destroyed in a, in a 
war scenario like this. Admiral Lenton had decided to reorder the uninjured dragons of Lily's formation as necessary from day to day to, to both keep the dragons occupied and patrol a somewhat greater extent. Today he had ordered Tamarare to fly point, with Natidus and Dulcia flanking him. They would trail Exidium's formation on the first leg of Channel Patrol, then break off for a pass over the main squadron of the Channel Fleet, currently just off Ushant and blocking the French port of Brest. Aside from the mere martial benefits, their visit would furnish the ships of the fleet with at least a little break in the lonely monotony of their blockade duty. The morning was so cold and crisp, no fog had gathered, the sky sharply brilliant and the water below almost black. Squinting against the glare, Lawrence would have liked to Im uh, imitate the ensigns and midwingmen who were rubbing black coal under their eyes, but as point leader, he would be in command of the small group where they were, where, while they were detached, and he would likely be asked aboard to see Admiral Lord Gardiner when they landed at the flagship, so he doesn't want to have a bunch of paint on his face when he meets the Admiral. Thanks to the weather, it was a pleasant flight, even if not a very smooth one. Wind currents seemed to, be, seemed to vary unpredictably once they had moved out over the open water, and Tamarare followed some unconscious instinct in rising and falling to catch the best wind. After an hour's patrol, they reached the point of separation. Captain Roland raised a hand in farewell as Tamarare angled away south and swept past Exidium. The sun was nearly straight overhead, and the ocean glittered beneath them. Lawrence, I see the ships ahead, Tamarare said, perhaps half an hour later, and Lawrence lifted his telescope, having to cup a hand around his eye and squint against the sun before he could see the sails on the water. Well sighted, Lawrence called back, and, get, and said, Give them the private signal, if you please, Mr. Turner. The signal ensign began running up the pattern, flag, pattern of flags that would mark them as a British party. Less of a formality in their case, thanks to Tamarare's unusual appearance. Everybody knows. Uh, what Tamarare looks like, no other dragon uh, on the, in the Western world looks like that, so they know who it is. Shortly they were sighted and identified. The leading British ship fired a handsome salute of nine guns, more perhaps than was strictly due to Tamarare, as he was an unofficial formation leader. Whether it was misunderstanding or generosity, Lawrence was pleased by the attention and had the riflemen fire off a return salute as they swept by overhead. The fleet was a stirring sight with the lean and elegant cutters already leaping across the water to cluster around the flagship in anticipation of the post. The great ships of the line, that's what they called the biggest, heaviest battleships that traditionally formed a line uh, together and fired their cannons in a broadside off against another sh set of ships which would form in a line. That's why I call them ships of the line, in case you didn't know, tacking steadily into the northerly wind to keep their position. White sails brilliant against the waters, colors flying in proud display from every mainmast. Lawrence could not resist leaning forward to watch over Tamarare's shoulder. So far, the carabiner straps. So far that the carabiner straps drew taut. Signal from the flagship, sir, Turner said as they drew near enough from, for the flags to be readable. Captain, come aboard on landing. Lawrence nodded, no less than he had anticipated. Pray acknowledge, Mr. Turner. Mr. Granby, I think we shall, we'll do a pass over the rest of the fleet to the south while they make ready for us. The crew of the Hibernia and the neighboring Asian Corps had been casting out the floating platforms that would be lashed together to form a landing surface for the dragons. And a small cut. So that's cool. Did you hear that? So they've got, they're going to make like a giant sort of floating dock. Have you ever been out of the lake or something like that? The floating docks. I think they're going to make a huge floating uh, structure that they must carry these, assumably, ab aboard these ships and stuff. Uh, lashed together to form a landing surface, and the small cutter was already moving among them, gathering up the tow lines. Lawrence knew from experience that the operation required some time and would go no quicker with the dragons circling directly overhead. Yeah, a little bit intimidating to the crew, the people assembling below. <clears throat> By the time they had completed their sweep and returned, the platforms were ready. Bellman up above, Mr. Gramby, Lawrence ordered. The crew of the lower rigging quickly came scrambling up onto Tamarare's back. The last few sailors hastily cleared off the deck as Tamarare made his descent, with Natidus and Dulcia following close upon him. The platform bobbed and sank lower in the water as Tamarare's great weight came upon it, but the lashings held secure. Natidus and Dulcia landed at opposite corners once Tamarare had settled himself, and Lawrence swung himself down, so they're doing a little bit of balancing act on there to make that work. Runners, bring the post, he said, and himself took the sealed envelope of dispatches from Admiral Lenton to Admiral Gardner. 
Lawrence climbed easily into the waiting cutter, while his runners, Roland, Dyer, Dyer, and Morgan, hurried to hand the bags of post over to the outstretched hands of the sailors. He went to the stern. Temeraire was sprawled low to better preserve the balance of the platform, with his head resting upon the edge of the platform very close to the cutter, much to the, much to the discomfort of that vessel's crew. "'I will return uh, presently,' Lawrence told him. "'Pray, give Lieutenant Granby the word if you require anything.' "'I will, but I do not think I will need to. "'I am perfectly well,' Tamarere answered, "'to startled looks from the cutter's crew, who o "'which only increased as he added. "'But if I could go hunting afterwards, I would be glad of it. "'I am sure I saw some splendid large tunnies on our way.' "'The cutter was an elegant, clean-lined vessel, "'and she bore Lawrence to the Hibernia "'at a pace which he would have once thought the height of speed.' Now he stood looking out along her bowsprit, running before the wind, and the breeze in his face seemed barely anything. They had rigged a bosun's chair over the Hibernia's side, which Lawrence ignored with disdain. His sea legs had scarcely deserted him, and in any case climbing up the side presented him with no difficulty. Captain Bedford was waiting to greet him, start and started in open surprise as Lawrence climbed aboard. They had served in, together in the Goliath at the Nile. "'Good Lord, Lawrence, I had no notion of your being here in the Channel,' he said, formal greeting forgotten, and meeting him instead with a hearty handshake. "'Is that your beast, then?' he said, staring across the water at Tamaraire, who was in his bulk not much smaller than the seventy-four-gun Agincourt behind him. "'I thought she had just hatched a six-month gone.' Lawrence could not help a swelling pride. He had hoped that he had concealed it as he answered. "'Yes, that is Tamaraire. He is not eight months old.' yet he does have nearly his full growth. With difficulty he restrained himself from boasting further. Nothing, he was sure, could be more irritating, like one of those men who could not stop, stop talking of the beauty of their mistress or the cleverness of their children. In any case, Tamaraire did not require praising. Any observer looking at him could hardly fail to mark his distinctive and elegant appearance. "'Oh, I see,' Bedford said, looking at him with bemused expression. Then the lieutenant at Bedford's shoulder coughed meaningfully. Oh! Bedford glanced back at the fellow and then said, Forgive me, I was so taken aback to see you that I've been keeping you standing about. Pray, come this way. Lord Gardiner is waiting to see you. Admiral Lord Gardiner had only lately come to his position as commander in the Channel, on Sir William Cornwallis's retirement. The strain of following so successful a leader in so difficult a position was telling upon him. Lawrence had served in the Channel Fleet several years before, as a lieutenant. They had never been introduced previously, but Lawrence had seen him several times, and his face was markedly aged. "'Yes, I see. Lawrence, is it?' Gardner said as the flag lieutenant presented him, and murmured a few words which Lawrence could not hear. "'Pray, be seated. I must read these dispatches at once. And then I have a few words to give you to carry back for me to Lenton,' he said, breaking the seal and studying the contents." Lord Gardiner grunted, nodded to himself as he read through the messages. From his sharp look, Lawrence knew, uh, knew when he reached the account of the recent skirmish. "'Well, Lawrence, you have seen some sharp action, I gather,' he said, laying the papers at last. "'It is just as well for you all to get some seasoning, I expect. I cannot be long before we see something more from them, and you must tell Lenton so for me. I have been sending every sloop and brig and cutter I dare to risk close into shore.' and the French are busy as bees in land or outside Cherbourg. We cannot tell with what, precisely, but they can hardly be preparing for anything but invasion, and judging by their activity, they mean it to be soon. Surely Bonaparte could have news of the fleet in... Surely Bonaparte could have more news of the fleet in Cadiz than do we, Lawrence said, disturbed by the intelligence. The degree of confidence augured by such preparations was frighteningly high. And though Bonaparte was certainly arrogant, his arrogance had rarely proven to be wholly unfounded. Not of the immediate events, no. Of that I am now thankfully certain. You have brought me confirmation that our dispatch riders have been coming back and forth steadily, Gardner said, tapping the sheaf of papers on his desk. However, we cannot be so wild as to imagine he can come across without his fleet. And that is suggests he expects them soon. Lawrence nodded. That expectation might still be ill-founded or wishful, but that Bonaparte had it at all meant Nelson's fleet was in imminent danger. Gart so you see that? They're saying there's something going on. Napoleon does plan to be coming over the water, 
But of course, with the British fleet in the way, those transports will all be blown to bits. So if he's getting so prepared for this invasion, surely he, attempt, he means to do something to the fleet. Gardner's seal packed of returning dispatch. Uh, Gardner sealed the packet of returning dispatches and handed them over. There. I'm much obliged to you, Lawrence, for you bringing the post to us. Now I trust you will join us for dinner, and of course your fellow captains as well, he said, rising from his desk. Captain Briggs of the Agent Corps will join us as well, I think. A lifetime of naval training had inculcated in Lawrence the precept that such an invitation from a superior officer was as good as a command, and though Gardner was no longer strictly his superior, it remained impossible to even think of refusing. But Lawrence could not help but consider Tamarare with some anxiety, and Natitis with even more. The Pascal's Blue was a nervous creature who required a great deal of management from Captain Warren under ordinary circumstances, and Lawrence was certain that he would be distressed at the prospect of remaining aboard the makeshift floating platform without his handler, and no officer above the rank of lieutenant anywhere to be seen. And yet dragons did wait under such circumstances all the time. If there had been a greater aerial threat upon the fleet, several might have been stationed upon the platforms at all times with their captains frequently called upon to join the naval forces in planning. Lawrence could not like this Lawrence could not like subjecting the dragons to such a weight for no better cause than a dinner, dinner engagement, but neither could he honestly say there was any actual risk to them. Sir, nothing would give me greater pleasure, and I am sure I speak for Captain Warren and Captain Chennery as well, he said. And there was nothing else to be done. Indeed, Gardner could hardly be said to be waiting for an answer. He had already gone to the door to call in his lieutenant. However, only Chennery came over in response to the signaled invitation, bearing sincere but mild regrets. Natidus will fret if he is left all alone, you see, so Warren thinks it much better if he does not leave him, was all the explanation he offered. Get made to Gardner very cheerfully, he seemed unconscious of the deep stoicism he was committing. Oh, solacism he was committing. Lawrence privately winced at the startled and somewhat offended looks this procured, not merely from Lord Gardner, but from the other captains and the flag lieutenant as well, though he could not help but feel relieved. Still, the dinner began awkwardly, and continued so. The Admiral was clearly oppressed by thoughts of his work, and there were long periods between his remarks. The table would have been a silent and heavy one, save that Chenery was in his usual form, high-spirited and quick to make conversation, and he spoke freely in complete disregard of the naval convention that, re that reserved the right of starting conversation to Lord Gardner. When addressed directly, the naval officers would pause very pointedly before responding to him as briefly as possible before dropping the subject. Lawrence was at first agonized on his behalf and then began to grow angry. It must have been clear to even the most sensitive temper that Chenery was speaking in ignorance. His chosen subjects were innocuous, and to sit in sullen and reproachful silence seemed to Lawrence a far greater piece of rudeness. So if you caught that there, all the other captain, I mean, all the other like officers are just waiting for uh, Lord Gardner, the senior person, to really kind of break into the conversation, but he's not. So they're kind of like, we don't want to start into any conversations if Lord Gardner hasn't already started first out of respect and Chenery just doesn't get it. So he's just sitting there being like, what is going on with everybody? Why, why are they like, why do they hate me? You know, why are they being so rude? Chenery could not help but notice the cold response. As yet he was only beginning to look puzzled, not offended, but that would hardly last. Then he gamely tried once more. This time Lawrence deliberately volunteered a reply. The two of them carried the discussion along between them for several minutes then Gardner, his attention drawn from his brown study, glanced up and contributed a remark. The conversation was thus blessed, and the other officers joined in at last. Lawrence made a great effort and kept the topic running throughout the rest of the meal. What ought to have been a pleasure thus became a chore. He was very glad when the port was taken off the table, and they were invited to step back up on deck for cigars and coffee. Sounds like an awesome meal. <laughs> I mean, yes, I think we all know what it's like to have to carry a conversation around a table. Uh, but still, a little, you know, cigars and coffee up on deck afterwards. Pretty nice. Taking his cup, he went to stand by the larboard taff rail to better see the floating platform. That is, if you're old enough to have a cigar and you're into that type of thing. All right, kids. Tamara was sleeping quietly with the sun beating on his scales, one foreleg dangling over the side into the water. And Natitis and Dulcia were resting against him. 
Bedford came back, came to stand and look with him in what Lawrence took as a contemplative, contemplative silence, companionable silence. After a moment, Bedford said, I suppose he is a valuable animal, and we must be glad to have him. But it is appalling you should be chained to such a life and in such company. Lawrence could not immediately command the power of speech in response to this remark, so full of sincere pity. Half a dozen answers all crowded to his lips. He drew a breath, but shook in his throat and said in a low, savage voice, Sir, you will not speak to me in such terms, either of Tamaraire or of my colleagues. I wonder that you should imagine such, a, such an address acceptable. Bedford step, stepped back from his vehemence. Lawrence turned away and left his copy cup clattering upon the steward's tray. Sir, I think we must be leaving, he said to Gardiner, keeping his voice even. As this is Tamaraire's first flight along this course, best we were, we were to return before sunset. Of course, Gardiner said, offering a hand. Godspeed, Captain. I hope we will see you again shortly. Despite this excuse, Lawrence did not find himself back at the covet until shortly after nightfall. Having seen Tamaraire snatch several large tunnies from the water, Natidus and Dulcia expressed the inclination to try fishing themselves, and Tamaraire was perfectly happy to continue demonstrating. The younger crewmen were not entirely prepared for their experience of being on board while their dragon hunted, but after the first plummeting drop had accustomed them to the experience, the startled yells vanished, and they rapidly came to view the process as a game. Lawrence found that his black mood could not survive their enthusiasm. The boys cheered wildly, each time Tamaraire rose up with yet another tunny wriggling in his claws, and several of them sought permission to climb below, the better to be splashed as Tamaraire made his catch. Thoroughly glutted and flying somewhat more slowly towards the coast, Tamaraire hummed in happiness and contentment, turned his head around to look at Lawrence with bright-eyed gratitude, and said, "'Has this not been a pleasant day?' It has been a long time since we've had such splendid flying. And Lawrence found that he could no longer, he could know that he had no anger left to conceal in making his reply. The lamps throughout the covet were just coming alight, like great fires against the darkness of scattered trees. The ground crews moving among them with their torches, even as Tamaraire made his descent. Most of the young officers were still soaking wet and beginning to shiver as they climbed down from Tamaraire's warm bulk. Lawrence dismissed them to their rest and stood watch with Tamaraire himself while the ground crew finished unharnessing him. Holland looked at him a little reproachfully as the men brought down the neck and shoulder harnesses encrusted with fish scales, bones, and entrails and already beginning to stink. Tamaraire was too pleased and well-fed for Lawrence to feel apologetic. He only said cheerfully, "'I'm afraid we have some heavy work for you, Mr. Holland, but at least he will not need feeding tonight.' Aye, sir, Holland said gloomily and marshaled his men to the task. The harness removed and his side washed down by the crew, who by this time had formed the technique of passing buckets along rather like a fire brigade to clean him after his meals, Tamaraire yawned enormously, belched, and sprawled out upon the ground with, with, uh, with so self-satisfied an expression that Lawrence laughed at him. I must go and deliver these dispatches, he said. Do you sleep, or shall we read this evening? Forgive me, Lawrence. I think I am too sleepy, Tamaraire said, yawning again. Laplace is difficult to follow, even when I am quite awake, and I do not want to risk misunderstanding. As Lawrence had enough difficulty for his own part, merely in pronouncing the French of Laplace's treatise on celestial mechanics, well enough for Tamaraire to comprehend, without making any effort for to himself, to grasp the principles he was reading aloud, he was perfectly willing to believe this. Very well, my dear. I will see you in the morning, then, he said, and stood stroking Tamaraire's nose until the dragon's eyes had slid shut and his breathing had evened out into slumber. And wherever you are, I hope this that uh, passage sends you off into blissful sleep, blissful rest, a nice little escape, a nice little break. But thank you all for reading along with me. I appreciate your patience and your encouragement as we go. And we will see you on the rest of Chapter 10 coming up in the next video.